So, what verse are we on tonight? We're in verse 24. 34. So, 24. we're in the 24. We're in the Adhikari Kari section, the qualifications of a fit student. And we focused last week on Shama, Dhamma, and Upadati, the tuning up exercises. So, we want to be able to practice keeping the sense organs residing in the sense centers, dhamma, at peaceful state of mind when it rests in steady contemplation of the goal after having again and again detached itself from the chaos of the sense objects, not letting the stuff out there grab it. Yeah, the example I like to use, say you're in the market, walking by and you see vegetables and you see some food and you pass by the bakery section of the chocolate cake. <clears throat> there goes your energy. But when I was young, it was so clear but I would see someone who was physically attractive. <laughs> like you can feel your energy leave. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. So don't oh, bring it back. Bring it back. Not letting the sense objects, the sensory data keep the mind from staying deeply introverted culminated in upadati sense withdrawal and he says the best sense withdrawal is when you can move in the world the sense objects you don't cause vrittis, don't cause agitations now an exercise I like to use for this so let's see 
we'll use Wendy as our guinea pig tonight. So if I go gobbledy gookty fifty frapty loopty boo blobby, how does that make you feel? <clears throat> Nothing. Why? I don't understand it. It's just you're a wonderful person. You are so <laughs> smart and intelligent. Good look. Yeah. And talented. Feel the difference? <laughs> yeah. Cobble the goofy fifty floppy boot you. <laughs> or you dumb ass. How could you have done that? What a total screw up you are. Not only that, you're fat and ugly. <laughs> Yes. You see the difference? <laughs> Thank you for playing it. That's very generous of you. But all it is is sense data. No, it's all just... it is. So treat it all like it's nonsense. Let it pass. Ooh. Don't let it land. M -D -M -D -M -D. Now, when we were around Swamiji, if you were tuned up, you were attached or identified. Poke, poke. And he would test us. He just, just bomb. Everything passed. And This takes enormous attention, enormous concentration in the beginning. You can do it for five or 10 minutes at a time. You're doing fabulously. Eventually, you want to get established. All right. So now I think our next one is to picture, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Uh, yes. So should I start? Please. Sahanam sarva dukhanam pratikara purvakam chinta vila parihitam sa titiksha nigar adhyate. Titiksha is the capacity to endure all sorrows and sufferings without struggling for redress or for revenge being always free from anxiety or lament over them. Yes. Lament, I think, is the way we do in U.S. English. So, Titiksha. The Master Jesus taught this. A man strikes you on the cheek, what are you supposed to do? Turn away. Yeah. If the Roman soldier says, carry my pack for a mile, what do you do? Carry it. He says, someone steals your coat, what do you do? Nothing. Give yeah. him another yeah. one. So the idea is to get out from under the victim mentality. Now listen very carefully. This is a hard one for Westerners to get. We do not get what we want in life. God is not Santa Claus. Hitting all the green lights of life is no indication of spiritual unfolding. It's the result of punya, meritorious actions. So, and it's fine. We don't even get what we need. What do we get? Inevitable results of our past actions. Tejo used to make this a little harsher. I mean, I'm not even going to go there because I don't like the way he phrased it. Anyway, we get the inevitable results of our past actions. So, to Tiksha 
invites us to deeply penetrate the law of karma. Karma just means action. Sometimes we say good karma, bad karma. That, that really has very little to do with what the law is. The law is the energy we put out physically and mentally comes back. It's like if you have a tub of water, you drop a stone into it, the ripples go out. They come back. That's all there is to it. So if today a sorrow or an affliction happens, why did it happen to me and not the next person? God doesn't aid me. I'm not being tested. It's the inevitable result of the force of the past maturity. That's all it is. And the vast majority of these past actions are done in ignorance. I was watching this really weird YouTube um, Queen Elizabeth the first and she was a smallpox survivor and it totally messed up her complexion so she made this uh, makeup they had in the Elizabethan period and it was lead and vinegar it was like a paste she put on her face made her face look very white Basically, to cover up the blemishes. They think that's probably what killed her, it's lead poisoning. Mm -hmm. The inevitable results of her actions. Not because she's bad, she just didn't know. Back in the 80s, when I had students who were dying of AIDS, am I being punished, Jim? No. You're getting the inevitable results of your actions. That's it. You had sex in the way where you got a bug. That's all there is to it. Did you have safe sex with that person? No, but we're in love. A bug doesn't care. So, when things that we deem negative happen to us, we have a point of power. Will I react with redress or revenge? They did this to me. Don't I have a right? To be angry and get back at them. This is what in the Hebrew scripture was an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And it was God who said, if you follow that, the whole world ends up blind. So at this point of power, we have a choice to respond rather than to react. So Tatiksha is not suffering false martyrdom. No, how I suffer in this world. But you're gonna get a gold star for enduring. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that. It's a deep penetration Understanding of the law of karma. Now, we don't need to know why. I'm picking up with you tonight. So, COVID <laughs> comes along, the economy crashes, her wonderful, wonderful restaurant can't sustain itself. Oh, what did I do wrong? 
can I rip on some restaurant in another life? You know, doesn't matter. You don't need to know why. Human mind wants to go causation hunting. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Why is it happening to me? As if understanding is going to fix it. And Werner Erhardt, the guy who invented the S training, which became the forum, which is now landmark, used to say understanding is the booby prize. Unchain it. But what you can do is if you can learn from it, see if you've done some things karmically that may not have been smart. And then to picture, choose to respond peace with forgiveness generosity. Oh, my landlord was such an asshole. I'm going to sue him. Knock yourself out. You can do that. But is that really where you want to go with your energy? You can do anything you want, you Any thoughts on this? It's a subtle, subtle teaching. So rather than respond, reacting to life when we're hurt, dress or revenge, get out of the reinfecting karmic cycle. Respond with forgiveness. Respond with generosity. Respond with understanding. Jim, you said that understanding is the booby prize, but isn't penetrating the law of karma like getting an understanding of it? Yes. But what I mean is, oh, why did this particular thing happen to me? Okay, I'm stuck in traffic. Was it because I drove an ox cart in the Middle Ages and I was too slow? So that's, that's what I mean. Surface level understanding. Yeah. No, the deep understanding. You're right. That's that's what you do want to do, is get a deep insight. And deep Jim, insight. if something happens that you know I don't like, and there is resistance or there is, you know, emotional whatever, is it sort of like fake it till you make it, like try your best? To respond with generosity, etc. Even if don't worry about your feelings. Okay. Just put the feeling on the side. Okay. Pay attention to your action. Got it. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, like stewing inside, like spiraling, like hate bile. That's is that an action? Well, it's energy going out. Okay. And actually, if we shift to the yamas and niyamas of Raja Yoga, one commentator says you can reduce them all to a himsa. It's true story. So I was watching a YouTube video of this person who would, was uh, interviewing the Dalai Lama. And they were talking about when uh, the Chinese invaded Tibet, massacred all these Tibetans and destroyed monasteries. And, and this person said to, to the Dalai Lama, well, why did you fight back? His holiness said, if we had fought back, if I had fought back, 
then the virus, the war, would have then been inside me. Very interesting language. Many people could not understand that the Dalai Lama did not fight. Yogi has ceased fighting anyone and anything. Or at least aspires to. Okay, Tatiksha, forbearance. Wonderful, wonderful quality of the fist. Next, I think, is uh, Shraddha, I recall. Shastrasya Guru Vakyasya Satyu Satya Buddhya Buddharana Sashradha Kathita Sat Dhirya Yavas Tupalabhyate That by which one understands the exact import of the scriptures as well as the pregnant words of advice of the preceptor is called Shraddha by the wise. By this alone does reality become manifestly clear. So, Shraddha means faith, but it carries a lot more flavors in Sanskrit than the English word. I have faith the sun's going to come up tomorrow. I have faith that if I turn the switch, the light will go on. You know, I have faith that the heat wave will eventually pass. We have faith in all sorts of things in the world in a practical sense. In a religious sense, you can have faith in a particular law. You can have faith in a particular religious doctrine. Here, what it means is I have faith that this freedom that the scriptures talk about is real. Faith. That's not where we stop. Swamiji used to say blind faith is stupid faith and it will fail us in the crisis. So our faith needs to be informed by reason. Think it Faith in the words of the teacher. The teacher says, try this, that, and the other thing. See the words. I meditated for three minutes and nothing happened, Jim. Well, try meditating for 20 minutes, at least five days a week, for several weeks, and then let's see what happens. I don't know. I just don't see how it works. You have enough faith to be a spiritual scientist. This is not being religious. What is a scientist to? They have a hypothesis and they perform an experiment to prove or disprove the hypothesis. That's how we're invited to approach this. Now, Shraddha has an even deeper, very cool meaning. For example, on a gorgeous fall day, you take a drive all the way out to Ocean Beach. And then fog starts to come in on a warm day. You see that beautiful mist start to come and the ozone is coming off the ocean and that tang in the air that's so uniquely San Francisco. Or 
maybe in the city and you can watch it come across Twin Peaks and stuff like that. Have you ever seen that in the city? It's so beautiful. Now, what happened? I have an experience and through my words, I said, come experience what I've experienced. And your mind go where my mind goes. If you could draw on your own direct experience and go where the teacher's mind goes, your capacity to do that is your front mind. So I go to the symphony and I hear last time I went it was the Beethoven third symphony the second movement is so sad it's a funeral march how do I know that it's sad what is it in me that can go where Beethoven's mind Any of you read poetry and are touched by poetry? Mm -hmm. Or you see a masterpiece of a painting and it just moves you deeply. What is it in you that can go where that work of art takes you? That's your shut up. So the teacher will say, you are not the body, you are not the prana, you are not the feeling, the thought. Just tune up the mind for just a little bit. Put your thumb on. Listen to the track. See if you can notice who and what hears the track. Think this way. See, there's nothing there. If you can go where my mind went, follow my words, that's your shut up. And it is through that that ultimate reality is made known. That's when we have Iksha, initiation. That's when we have Abhisheka, the anointing. Any thoughts on this? Wonderful, wonderful word, Shraddha. And then we have the last one, Samadhana. Sarvada sthapanam buddhe, shuddhe brahmani sarvatha, tat samadhanam smikyuktam natu chittasya lalanam. Samadhana, tranquility, is that condition when the mind is constantly engaged in the total contemplation of the supreme reality, and it is not gained through any amount of intellectual oscillations. Yes. This is so important. So in Gita, Krishna says the person of steady wisdom is one whose mind is sthita, still. No matter what they have heard and what they have heard. Vedanta is a non-intellectual path for intellectuals. It's a way of thinking that gets us out of our thinking. So you may read something in the scripture, and this is especially a challenge when we're always getting this stuff in translation. And you go, wait a minute, 
I thought, <laughs> and then your mind will start to oscillate. Well, is it this or is it that? Is it this or is it that? What's the difference between consciousness and awareness? Is there a difference? Chit and Chaitanya. Oh, is there a distinction? What about the mind and the intellect? What's the difference? I'm not sure I understand that. Have you had your mind do that kind of stuff? Yes, no? Mm -hmm. Drop it. We'll just share something with you. You haven't figured this out yet. Vedanta is incredibly repetitive. <laughs> <laughs> On purpose. There are only a few really important significant. Come around, and if our mind is subtle enough to receive the teaching, we go, oh, yeah. And if it's not, your mind will go, <coughs> what did that mean? Is it this? Is it that? Well, what about that? What about this? Oscillation. And what Shankar is saying here is put it on the shelf. Don't worry. It will come around again. In a different verse, different scripture, different form. And when that idea is introduced, you go, oh, of course. Why did I struggle with that so much last year when I first heard that idea? Who's had that experience? Scripture hasn't changed. But we have become more subtle. Keep it simple. Again, I'm very fond of Ramana Maharshi's very simple directive. Stay with the question, Koam, who am I? What is my essential nature? Akasa Bhaira. Keep meditating, keep turning the mind within, and let go, let go, let go. So this completes our gang of six. So we started with Viveka, discrimination, Vairagya, detachment or dispassion, Three, the gang of six, Shama, Dhamma, Uparati, Vitiksha, Shraddha, Samadhana. Now we enter, there might be one more verse on Samadhana, I can't remember. But we may be entering into the fourth qualification, Mumukshutra. Let's see what he says. Ahankara de de hantan, Bandhan of Jana Kalpita, Swaswarupa, Babodhena, Muktam Icha Mumukshuta, Mumukshutva is the impatient and burning desire to release oneself by realizing the real nature of one's self from all bondages of egoism. To the body, etc., which are bondages created by ignorance. Yes, very dense one. So the bondage, what is the cause of it? The ignorance. And I want to be free. I want to be out. I don't know yet really what the problem is, but I know God's the answer. Now there's a very, very famous Zen story where the disciple says to the Zen master, what must I do in order to achieve enlightenment? The master says to the youngster, come with me down to the river. The youngster is saying, oh, I'm going to get initiated, bathed in the water, so true. The old man wades out into the water and brings 
bir yapmış oluyor. Then he grabs him by the head. Pushes his head under the water. Ah, washed in the waters of truth. Oh, this is so marvelous. Swims under there. And he says, Come on, let me out. This is no joke. Old man stronger than he thought. Holds him under the water. My God, the guy's trying to kill me. Let me up. Let me up. Struggles, struggles, struggles. And the old man just pulls him up to the water. And the young man, I'm drowning. I need air. I need air. I need air. Finally, the old man lets him up and he's sputtering. Frightened and furious, and the old man says, When you were under the water, thinking about it, air, air, I must have air. And he says, When you want liberation, intensity. And So Shankara says for us to become a moksha. Usually translated as a seeker after liberation. Needs having the burning desire. Now people begin to study spirituality and join communities for all sorts of reasons. When I was in the ashram, a lot of people went there because they wanted community, they wanted connection, romance, or what Trumpa calls spiritual materialism. Oh, it's a way for me to say, oh yes, I'm a disciple of so and so and such and so. I got a new name. My guru gave me this name at initiation. I've been to this place in India, that place in South America. We have all sorts of ulterior things. I tell you, if you have the burning desire for liberation a rock or a light and if you don't have it Lord Shiva himself now those of you who are Indian help me out I always forget this story the fellow who went to Drona and couldn't uh, take archery lessons for him and and built a little doll, I think it was, of Jonah and studied archery with him. Is that uh, mm -hmm. Karna? It's Eklavya. Say it again. Eklavya, I think. Anyway, yeah. but the whole point is he had an idol of Jonah, the archery teacher. And he learned archery from that. And his desire to be a great warrior was so intense that he got what he would have gotten from the great teacher from Jonah. So there's another true story. Down the street, Baba Muktananda was there. And there was a Western disciple who came to him. He said, Baba, I have traveled all over the world looking for the perfect master. Are you he? Baba did this through translation, but he says, interesting you should say that. I've been looking for the perfect student. Are you he? The fellow got very 
dejected. Hard to walk away. Bob says, come on back. Maybe we can work something out. <laughs> <laughs> So back to what Shankara said at the very beginning of the section. Success in spiritual endeavors is some would do, yeah. only do on Tuesdays. <laughs> What's he say? <laughs> Entirely do. To the degree of the qualifications of the fits me. Beka, Vairagya, Shamadi Guna, for having trouble, go to this section for a tuna, from Jesus to see. See where maybe you're a little short shrift on one little intention. Now, we don't become a fit student then engage in another practice to realize the self. I tell you, the moment you're a fit student, you have to go back. All of our sadhana is just becoming a fit student. Did that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, next verse. Isn't this great stuff? <laughs> Manda Matyamaru Papi Veragyena Shamadina Prasadena Guru Seyam Pravritha Suyate Palam Half-hearted and mediocre aspirants in a seeker may also come to bear fruit, being increased by the grace of the Guru and by means of renunciation, calmness, etc. Yeah. So... <coughs> If our momo chukwa is weak, it can be increased by the grace of the Guru. We spend time with the teacher, get tuned up, we get that taste, that emptiness, that And then back to what we were talking about, about your low-grade depression idea. With Bhairagya, as we give up the world, I want the world. Moksha liberation. I want to see God face to face in scripture. In the Christian scripture. Only this I want, but to know the Lord. Same idea. So it's a value to read stories of saints. This can inspire us. Keep holy company. Don't worry too much about the world. I like to say largely we're healed far more by what we turn to rather than what we turn from. Jesus's, you know, explanation of the greatest commandment does not say Leave the world, leave the world, leave the world. What does he say? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and mind and strength. This is the greatest commandment. The second is like unto the first, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. 
these two commandments hang all the law on the prophets. Until I grew up with the King James Version, the answer. Turn to the infinite as much as you can, as often as you can, in whatever way you can. This will increase your emotional life. All right, next verse. Bairagyam cha mumokshutvam tivram yasya to vidyate tasmin ne vartavantasyu halavanta shamadayaha. Calmness and other practices have their meaning and they bear fruit indeed only in them who has an intense spirit of renunciation and yearning for liberation. So, desire gets a bad rap in some people's minds. Oh, we're supposed to not have any desires. That's not correct. What the scripture says is we are to sublimate <coughs> our desires into the desire for liberation. What do we mean by sublimate? We let go of a lesser desire for something greater. What I like to use is the college kid who's in the dorm and it's Friday night and they've got a big test on Monday and they really, really want to do well on this test. A lot of their future depends on it. And their friends come by and say, we're going out for pizza and beer. Come join us. Like any 19-year-old or 20-year-old. No, oh, no, oh, no, oh, beer and us. They say, no, oh, I want to go. But then they think it through. This test is far more. Let go of the lesser because of my desire for the greater. So this desire for liberation is the engine behind our sadhana. It's the passion that drives you. We are not asked to be passionless. We are invited to take our passion. Any thoughts on this? Let me give you a worldly example. Back when I was teaching at Cal State Hayward, I'd be walking around the music building at like 10 o'clock at night. I love to walk through a music building. Got all these little practice rooms. There's all these kids in there. <laughs> oh, going on all the time. And you could tell who's going to make it as a musician. They're the ones who had the passion. They loved to practice. They wanted to master their craft. They loved music. Not the ones who wanted celebrity. I had other alternative reasons. Love. Any thoughts on this? So what we are to do is to take our passion and put it in the place where it belongs. All right, next verse. That will lead us into some people say. Etayor Mandataya 
Mitra Virakta Tva Mumukshayo Mara Salai Lavatatra Shama Dev Bhana Matrata I like Here is another one on this. Go ahead. Shama, etc. become as ineffectual as the mirage in the desert in them who have oblique detachment and a yearning for freedom. Yes. So remember what we said about this little literary technique? If Shankara thinks it's a really, really important idea, he will repeat it. This is a third verse, isn't it? Mm -hmm. On this one topic. He said the same thing. Three verses. So if you're paying attention, oh, put a star next to this. This is a really, really important point. Going on. Section in, Bhakti, firm and deep. Yeah. Moksha Karana Samagrayam Bhakti Reva Giriyasi Swasarupanu Sandhanam Bhakti Ritya Bhidhiyate Among the instruments and conditions necessary for liberation, Bhakti alone is supreme. A constant attempt to live up to one's own real nature is called single pointed devotion. So, this uh, four qualifications that we've just done, that appears in one scripture or some scriptures. Others say, no, that's not really where it's at. What's most important is bhakti, which is devotion. Christianity is a bhakti yoga. It's rooted in love. So we don't want our sadhana to just be from the neck up. It also needs to involve God. So in the Chinmaya mission, when I was there going to camps, always in the evenings, before class, we'd all sing bhajans. It happened all the time. People would get together to chant the name of the Lord. For those of us who are Westerners, we may not have that call. Frankly, I have been a church musician on and off the vast majority of my life. What warms my heart It's Christian devotional songs. I'm drawn far more to that than I have to budgets. Uh, Mike's another Catholic. At every Mass, um, one of the things that happens is the singing of one of the Psalms of David. Oh, that was my favorite part. The Psalms of David was Jesus's prayer book. He quotes the Psalms more than any other uh, uh, book uh, in the Hebrew Bible. And so much of it is about loving God. Of course, with music, it hits a different part of the brain. What do you do for a living, Jim? I sing God's praises. What a wonderful job. This is what I got paid to do. Really, really cool job. Wonderful job. Now, others of us are not mush pots. Our temperament is cooler. Do I need to be standing on street corners chanting Hare Krishna? I go to Kirtan and 
over again. Over again. I, without hope and Shankara knows that a lot of us who are studying Vega Jirama, we approach the world more through our head than through our feelings. So he says the constant attempt to live up to our real nature it's also the notion Even in our use of the word, you can be devoted to social justice. You can be devoted to animal rights. That doesn't mean you go out and go, ah, dead puppies, dead puppies. No, it, you don't have to do that. It doesn't have to be emotionalism. If you like doing that, knock yourself out. It's a rich tradition. But you can be devoted to many things in this world without being all mushy. You can be mushy. And mushy. But you can have enormous commitment to your yoga and that too is devotion very important point any thoughts on this to review though it is important to engage our feeling nature to some degree, if we can. Who open that Arama Prema, the supreme love of the infinite. Any thoughts on this? All right, next verse. Section 9. Courtesy of Approach and Questioning. Swatma tatva no sanhanam apiritya pare jagumu upta sadhanam sampanna tatva jigyasu ratmanaha upasidhe guru pragyam yasmat bandha vimokshanam Others say that bhakti means a constant inquiry into the real nature of one's own self. One who has the above mentioned qualities and is anxious to know the self must therefore devotedly serve a teacher well established in knowledge for redeeming themselves from bondage. Yes. So if you have these qualifications of a fit student, then Shankara says, seek expert advice. So many people in the West, I'm following my own path. But if you look to any worldly endeavor, computer programming, cooking, social services, nuclear physics. I'm just doing it on my own. You can do that, but you're probably going to take a lot of detours that are unnecessary. Go down some side paths that don't really leads to your goal. But if you seek expert advice, and what's so cool about the tradition, so Wendy, I'm just going to pick on you. <laughs> so someone can go to culinary school. 
right? Yeah. Or you can apprentice under a master chef in a really good restaurant. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. That's mm -hmm. a guru. Yeah. See. And you learn mm -hmm. from someone who is an expert. Now, many of us have trust issues. I don't want to surrender to a guru. Nobody's going to run my life. Sometimes it takes a long time to learn to trust the teacher. Now, this is not Shankara. This is Jim. Things you should watch out for. You need to have a Good bullshit detector. If you come across a teacher, even if they've got a lot of power, do they want your money? Do they want to have sex with you? Do they want to run your life? Chances are this is something you should be very cautious about. Probably run in the other direction. The real woman of wisdom or man of wisdom wants nothing. They are full. But it's their nature. Give this knowledge to a Fitzhu. So, if you trust in someone who's not worthy, the worst that can happen is you're disappointed. But if you're unable to trust anyone, Probably end up on the surface of the spiritual life. Only. Any thoughts on this? Next verse. Chotriyo Brijano Kama Eto Yo Brahma Victamaha. Brahmanya Parataha Shanto Nirindhana Ivan Nalaha Ahe Tukka Dayasindhu Panduramana Tam Satam. So this is a prose verse. Now we have what to look for in the teacher. He who is well versed in the scriptures. Sinless, unaffected by desires, a full knower of the Supreme, who has retired into the Supreme, who is as calm as the fire that has burnt up its fuel, who is a boundless ocean of mercy that needs no cause for its expression, and who is an intimate friend to those who have surrendered unto him. Yeah. Who's your guru? Oh, uh, Shirdi Sai Baba. Isn't he dead? Oh, yes, but he's not here. Who is your guru? Uh, Amaji, have you ever met her? No, no, but I, I've decided she's my guru. This kind of relationship, basically what you're doing is you're using the guru as an idol like a statue of Shiva or Krishna or Jesus, as a stand-in, an icon. That's not what Shankara says about the teacher. Now we have here a list again. Remember what we said about lists? Usually the most important thing is listed first. Especially if it's prose verse. It's not like you put it in a particular order for the meter. 
So the first one is Shrutya. Well versed in the scriptures. Why? The scriptures contain what we call the Pramana, the means of knowledge. There are enlightened beings in this world who may have devotees, but are unable to transmit this knowledge. Swamiji had enlightened disciples that fall from him like the dew. Because he was a master of wielding the means. I don't get this too much anymore, but in the old timey days, I get this question. Oh, Jim, why do you teach from those dusty old Sanskrit scriptures? Why don't you just talk from your heart? Because the scriptures are so incredibly powerful. And if you learned how to wield the means of knowledge, then Great things happen. I feel very, very blessed that I was taught the means of knowledge by Swamiji as well. So I think the next one is sinless. Yeah. Yes. So that doesn't necessarily mean that the guru doesn't make mistakes. But the level of the equipment, there's two ideas that are in tension. Everything the guru does is the hand of God. It's all perfect. I got news for you. That's everything in this world. Who can make a mistake? But you will find in the guru that she has no agenda that she's going to. You and I have nothing that the guru wants. Their only joy in the relationship is our waking up. Who's a spiritual midwife? The wife doesn't have the baby. It's great joy when the baby's born. Trotrium, sinless. Unafflict unafflicted by desires. Yes. So back to those things, do they? Do they want your money? Do they want to have sex with you? Do they want to micromanage your life? You can tell if there's some agenda, some desire that's afflicting. Or do they exemplify? And then the next one, full knower of the Supreme. Yeah. So you want a guru who's not, oh, I had an experience 20 years ago. No, you want a guru who's sthita pragna. There all the time. Never forgets herself. She has steady wisdom. And I love this next one. Who has 
be tired to be seen. That's what was so amazing about being without a strategy. After a while, there was no verbal teaching anymore. I knew what he was going to say. <laughs> Tune up into so so deep inside. What's the next idea? Was as calm as the fire that has burnt up its fuel. Oh, I love this image. So, if you're out camping and at the end of the evening the coals are banged and there's just the embers left, what was that campfire like hours earlier? So I think it was St. Augustine who said, every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. <laughs> so understand, I would see Swamiji, we would see other great Mahatma. Oh, I could never be like that. I'm such a bold person. Understand. When that fire of desire and identification burns up all the fuel, and it's just banged coals. It's wonderful, wonderful image. One of my favorite things. Next idea, Bias Hindu. That's right. Oh, Bias Hindu, who's an ocean Sindhu of compassion or of mercy or of kindness. Incarnation. One of Swamiji's famous sayings, my love is like a fire hose. Whoever gets in front of me gets lost. And no judgment. Whoever was there was the one. No end to the love. Even dropping his body. Has no way to finish. Next idea. Intimate friend? Yeah. Intimate friend to of those who have surrendered unto him. So it's a relationship. It's a human relationship. There used to be a slogan I heard, I can't remember where I heard it, dead gurus can't kick ass. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's a relationship. It's a relationship. That's why traditionally in the Himalayas, there were thousands and thousands of disciples and it wasn't done on YouTube and stuff like that. It's an intimate friend. There is a parallel term that comes out of the Catholic monastic tradition which started among the Irish monks, where you would have uh, 
where confession started to happen, where you would go to someone, a senior monk, and, and, and talk to them about your practice and stuff like that. And the term was abacus alma. Have you heard that one, Mike? I don't know the word. I, I know that what was happening, but I don't know that word. Abacus means friend. All my is soul, a friend of my soul. Isn't that a wonderful expression? So the Buddha is an amicus home, a friend of my soul. Now, Swamiji used to joke. Whenever he unfolded this verse, he always had to have the picture of Swami Thakurana behind him. <laughs> all right, I think that's all the pieces of that verse. Yeah, all right, we'll end. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadhaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Hare Om Sri Guru Namaha Thank you all.